So welcome to today's uh, webinar. Uh, the topic today is fall prevention, an overview of evidence-based model of care for older adults who fall. Our guest presenter is Dr. Jennifer Davis, an assistant professor with the University of British Columbia. So just to introduce, Family Caregivers of BC is grateful to the Ministry of Health Patients as Partners Initiative for allowing us to provide these webinars as learning opportunities to caregivers across the province. For today's webinar, please just make sure your mic is muted, your video camera is off. We will be using the Q&A feature in the webinar. You can type in your questions, we'll be monitoring them, and they'll be answered at the end of the presentation. Just to let you know, there is no chat feature in this webinar. If you have a problem or an issue, pop it into the questions and we'll resolve it uh, as part of that. So first, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about Family Caregivers in BC. Uh, for over 30 years, we have been a nonprofit charity dedicated 100% to the well-being of family caregivers. We are one of the first of its kind in Canada. There are currently only three provincial organizations across the nation. We've been serving BC as a provincial organization since 2010. And for the past five or more years, we've been part of the Ministry of Health Patients as Partners Initiative. As part of what we do, we provide three pillars of support, caregiver support, caregiver education, and then engagement and collaboration. In our support pillar, we have a caregiver support line that operates Monday to Friday from 8.30 to 4.30. That line provides information, validation, referral, and navigation. Caregiver support groups are also available across the province, both in person and virtually. Caregiver coaching is available on a one-to-one -one basis after a short assessment with our caregiver support line staff. And we have an online caregiver resource center where webinars just like this one get posted as recordings, as well as many other resources I'll speak about in a moment. Under education, we provide that resource center where we have articles, blogs, webinars, videos, and audio podcasts. Our newsletter is published four times a year, and we send out e-news blasts on a monthly basis. Our support group facilitator training is provided both to volunteers for our organization and staff and community volunteer organizations across BC. This helps us help other organizations in the community provide those much needed caregiver support groups. We also provide outreach to community groups and try to act as a provincial resource for sharing knowledge and information. In terms of engagement and collaboration, we work to improve the quality of health policy. We provide presentations to interest groups, target audience members and stakeholders at all levels. We have volunteers and staff who contribute to participation in health committees, and we collaborate with condition-specific organizations, health authorities, and we try to participate where we can in Ministry of Health research. Just want to do the territorial acknowledgement. We are all part of different communities, and those communities lie in many territories across the province. For myself, I'm humbled to be speaking to you as a settler from the unceded land of the Lekwungen and Saanich First Nations, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt Nations. These nations are part of the Coast Salish peoples, and I wish to humbly acknowledge that I have the privilege of living and working in this territory. Let us please consider the impacts colonization has had on the peoples of this land. I encourage each of us to contribute to organizations committed to learning from Indigenous communities about the generational costs of colonization. Our presenter today is Jennifer Davis. Dr. Davis enthusiastically contributes as a co-director of operations for the Fall Prevention Clinic at the Vancouver General Hospital. Dr. Davis is working collaboratively on an initiative to apply proven cost-effective and cost-saving secondary fall prevention interventions for high-risk older adults across BC. Jennifer has served on the editorial board since 2008 as a deputy editor since 2017 for the health economic submission to the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Welcome, Jennifer. I'm absolutely honored and privileged to have your time and participation today.
Hey, thank you so much for the introduction, Victoria. Um, I would like to start by uh, with a land acknowledgement. I would like to respectfully acknowledge that I'm joining today from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Sequetmik Nation. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of this land. Um, thank you all uh, for joining today. Um, it's really a privilege to be here. And um, I first wanna start by thanking uh, the family caregivers of BC. I know myself and family members have been recipients of care provided by family caregivers and um, certainly grateful for that support. So thank you. Um, Victoria, you're able to advance to next slide, please. So today I'll be sharing with you an overview of the type of uh, best practice and evidence-based care that's provided at the Falls Prevention Clinic. So I'll give an overview of the model of care that older adults who experience a fall receive. Um, just to give you an overview of the talk for today. Next slide, please. Um, I'd like to start first with the motivation. So the motivation for, for why, why I think it's important to prevent falls. The following is a quote from an 82 year old woman who experienced a fall um, and she was seen at the Falls Prevention Clinic. She stated, the minute I hit that floor, my life changed. It has been downhill ever since. Now, the reason I share this quote is because this woman's story is not unique. Um, sadly, this is the pathway that many individuals who experience a fall um, endure. And this individual never returned home. They were transferred to a nursing care home uh, where they spent um, their remaining time. And, and really, it, it highlights the compelling reason um, and the impact that falls can have on individuals' quality of life, their morbidity, and their mortality. Um, so this quote really hit home for me and, and serves as an ongoing motivation for why I'm really dedicated in the area of falls prevention. Next slide, please. So to provide an overview of the, the next 30 minutes or so, um, I'll start by reviewing the costs and consequences of falls. And then I'll go into a discussion about what we know about falls and how we can work to prevent falls um, by targeting factors that we can potentially change. I'll then provide an overview of the care pathway that patients who sustain a fall um, receive at the falls prevention clinic. And then I'll close by discussing some future goals and implications of this type of multidisciplinary care pathway. So defining falls, a fall is an event which results in a person coming to rest inadvertently on the ground or the floor or other lower level. Um, this definition was most recently updated by the World Health Organization in 2021. Next slide, please. We know that falls in older adults are really a geriatric giant of aging. And they actually are the third leading cause of chronic disability across the globe. Now, half of the 30% of community dwelling older adults who fall every year actually experience recurrent falls. And this places this um, set of individuals at significantly increased risk for hospitalization, institutionalization, and death. We also know that falls continue to place an increasing demand on costs and society, um, also at the level of the healthcare system and at the level of individuals and their families and caregivers. Um, now, some of this um, increasing demand and cost is due to a number of factors. One is that we're seeing an increase in the proportion of older adults. We're also seeing some increases with this increase in proportion of older adults, increases in multimorbidity, um, as well as polypharmacy and increases in frailty. Now I'm gonna discuss the burden of falls at different levels, um, at a societal level, a healthcare system level, and then moving to the individual uh, person level. So we see now more than ever, um, as I'm sure each of you 
in this session is aware that our healthcare system is stretched beyond capacity. And further contributing to this stretch, um, we've moved through and are continuing to move through the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but we also see that the cost of health and healthcare continues to rise. Um, this is due to a number of different factors, uh, but I'll keep it specific to falls for this presentation. Um, so looking at falls data alone, we see annually across the globe that 17 million years of life are lost from falls annually. Um, falls also do result in significant societal and economic consequences. So for example, one fall leading to a hip fracture can cost in excess of $30,000 per person. Um, at a global level, we see that approximately 1% of healthcare costs are related to fall falls in high income countries. Now, moving on to the impact of falls on individuals. Individuals can really sustain substantial impact um, at the level of disability uh, from injurious falls as well as mortality, and we see this worldwide. Some consequences of falls in older adults can include physical injury, um, ranging from bruises, abrasions, lacerations, all the way to fracture. Um, we also see disability, functional decline, loss of independence, as well as loss of autonomy. And all of these factors do feed into an individual's quality of life. Now, older adults in some clinical care settings do experience more falls. So examples of clinical care settings where we see more falls would be hospitals, subacute or rehabilitation units, assisted living settings, or care homes. Fortunately, um, there are some newly published world guidelines for falls prevention and management uh, published by Manuel Montero Odasso and colleagues. It includes an international collaboration um, that really comes up with review of the evidence for the prevention and management of falls. And the goal of these guidelines is to better capture risk identification and management strategies for falls. So I'll come back to kind of the specifics of these um, a little bit later in the presentation. So continuing on with the patient perspectives, um, you may have heard of the quote, it was over 10 years ago. Um, it was a classic quote in published in the British Medical Journal. Um, and the quote was, the operation was a success, but the patients died. Now, this quote broke many headlines. And the reason for it is because the metric that they used to measure the operational success was completely unrelated to the patient's perspective of their own health status. And since um, this particular publication, there's been this growing movement of the importance of valuing patients' views and patient perspectives on their own health status. And so one method that has evolved um, in the past, over the past decade, is the use of patient-reported outcome measures. And this is a type of standardized and structured approach where a measure is used to allow patients to report their view of their own health status. And the notion behind this is that patients' own perspectives of their health status help researchers, help healthcare professionals, allied healthcare professionals uh, develop a more multidimensional view and profile of patients that they're working with and their lives. We see that among understanding the perspectives of individuals with lived experience, um, we see that evidence continues to grow, um, that the views of older adults with lived experiences, the views of their carers, um, and the views of other stakeholders involved in their care pathway um, are really essential to inform um, both the feasibility and the suitability of guideline recommendations. Um, and this was, um, recently uh, published again by the World Health Organization. Now, the good news is that we can prevent falls. 
Um, and there's a lot of evidence surrounding fall prevention. So Kathy Sherrington and colleagues have published uh, a Cochrane systematic review um, detailing a number of effective approaches for preventing falls. Um, what several systematic review evidence does say is that uh, we get the best value for our money in terms of falls prevention from targeting groups that are at highest risk of future falls. Um, so these might be individuals that have sustained a fall in the past year, um, individuals who've had a fall risk assessment and are deemed high risk, um, or individuals who have um, a number of risk factors for falling that deem them at high risk for falls. Another important consideration is that uh, the focus is on targeting factors that are modifiable, so factors that we can change. So just a list of some modifiable factors for falling include fear of falling, mobility limitation, balance impairment, visual impairment, reduced muscle strength, or poor reaction time. Now also detailed in the literature are a number of different types of fall prevention strategies. Um, so they're, they're just listed here and they range from multifactorial to single factor. The main difference between these is that multifactorial would target several different um, approaches and use several different approaches for pre preventing falls, whereas a single factor intervention would just be one intervention delivered alone to target risk factors for falling. So an example of a single factor intervention, exercise, prescription, whereas an example of a multifactorial intervention, which we'll discuss in this presentation, would be um, the falls prevention clinic. We know that um, there's great potential for in falls prevention, both from a patient perspective, a healthcare system perspective, um, and a societal perspective. Um, we see that falls are costly to patients themselves, to the healthcare system, and from a societal perspective, um, when we're considering uh, carers of the patients, um, as well as um, consequences to patients themselves. So in review of the economic evaluation data, uh, we do find that there is evidence that most efficient allocation of resources comes from targeting high-risk groups. Next slide, please. And we're fortunate in BC because we have a comprehensive set of guidelines, um, and you'll see the link here for these guidelines on this slide. And uh, certainly happy to provide the link in the in the Q and A box as well after the presentation. And these guidelines were developed um, by the Protocols Advisory Committee, and. These guidelines are intended for uh, practitioners to identify and manage older adults living in the community uh, for fall prevention. So these guidelines go over risk factors for falling. Um, they go over evaluating a patient for falls risk, and they also detail a series of follow-up recommendations. Um, so some of these type of follow-up recommendations can include different referral options. Um, so these might include exercise prescriptions, um, geriatric medicine, home and community care, advanced care planning, and vision correction. Now, I'd mentioned um, just a few slides back about how the world, um, there are world guidelines available now, just recently published in 2022 for falls prevention and management. And these are, this is a helpful schematic um, that was published with these world guidelines. And what you'll see the goal here is, is it's really to help identify what level of risk individuals are at for falling. Um, so one of the key pathways is first to determine if an individual has had a fall in the past 12 months. And you can see that if yes, they have, then they move um, immediately to a high risk zone. Um, you can see that moving down to the other yellow box, the gate and balance, um, this can be assessed um, through a time up and go test, um, which is the tug. So a tug time of greater than 15 seconds uh, would indicate that an individual may 
uh, be at intermediate risk for falling. So depending on a pathway or the information that you have available to assess an individual, um, it can help determine which way they would flow in this diagram. And we can see that in terms of identifying low risk versus intermediate versus high risk, it really varies what type of prevention effort would be focused to that individual. So low risk, uh, individuals deemed low risk would um, benefit from primary prevention. So this would include education on falls prevention um, and advice on exercise or physical activity. Now, individuals on intermediate risk and high risk both receive secondary prevention. Um, the main difference here is that we see that individuals who are at high risk of falling um, are recommended to have a multifactorial fall risk assessment, um, as well as having interventions that are actually individually tailored to that individual's own fall risk profile. Um, now, the reason I'm taking a moment to emphasize this high risk um, is that this is the type of um, patient population that we do focus on at the falls prevention clinic. So we do focus on the multifactorial falls risk assessment, um, as well as the focus on the individually tailored interventions. Next slide, please. I'd also like to highlight, so we reviewed the BC um, resource page and guidelines that are published on the website, and we've now had a look at the World Falls Prevention um, and Management Guidelines. Um, there also are other guidelines available, um, and there are a lot of commonalities between these guidelines, which is great. Um, so I won't spend too much time on this one, but just to highlight that there also are the American Geriatric Society recommendations. Um, and we see here that um, they define fall assessment um, to include several factors that we've already seen mentioned. So review of medications, vision, balance, um, overall health, mobility, um, other medical conditions. Next slide, please. I'd just like to take a moment to review a study. Um, this was a study conducted um, over 10 years ago, but it kind of, I'm just sharing it with you to uh, provide a bit of a, uh, a history as to, um, you know, why we've seen some movement in terms of uh, more recent publications with development of fall prevention guidelines. Now, this study uh, was actually conducted among older adults who presented to the emergency department because of a fall. And the goal of this study was really to assess um, the proportion of patients who present with a fall to the emergency department, how many of those patients receive guideline care for falls or partial guideline care for falls. So guideline care for falls was um, defined at the time as a geriatric assessment or an assessment for fall risk um, where the individual then received multifactorial intervention uh, from a healthcare professional. And partial guideline care at the time was defined as an individual who was seen in the emergency department by a geriatric triage nurse and assessed for fall risk or provided with one element of an intervention. So not a multifactorial intervention, but provided with um, uh, one element. And then no guideline care was the last option. Next slide, please. So this study included 54 older adults who presented to the emergency department. Um, and the interesting finding was that over a decade ago, 46 people received no guideline care. Next slide, please. Now the following, um, I'm just showing you. So this is a graph of falls risk. Um, this graph is generated from a comprehensive assessment. Um, the physiological profile assessment was developed by Stephen Lord and colleagues in Australia. And it's used um, at the Falls Prevention Clinic to come up with a fall risk profile for individuals. And this fall risk profile can help determine an individual's risk for falling. Um, so what we see here is that a value of 1.73, this was the group mean um, at baseline when they started the trial. Um, so they were at moderate risk for falling. 
we see that over a period of six months, this cohort of individuals that we were following over time, um, uh, they became um, at marked increase. So they moved from a moderate to a high risk zone for falls. And we noted that their fall risk actually increased by 29% over the six months. So why do I show this? Um, well, really I show this because this was a population of individuals that um, did not receive an intervention. So we saw that two received um, guideline care, complete guideline care. And so it really places emphasis on the importance of um, intervention for individuals who are falling um, so that they don't continue to decline over time. Next slide, please. So this brings us to one of our uh, mission statements at the Falls Prevention Clinic. Um, and the Falls Prevention Clinic is a partnership among healthcare professionals, allied healthcare professionals, um, with the common goal of improving quality of life of individuals who are falling um, through reducing falls and ultimately fracture. Next slide, please. So our aim is to enhance mobility and prevent falls and fractures using evidence-based practice and research. So the Falls Prevention Clinic is a referral-based clinic that specializes in preventing falls and fractures among older adults living in the community who are 65 years and older. Um, our mission is really to identify and understand reasons why our patients fall. And by identifying these reasons, we can hopefully address and work in collaboration with healthcare professionals, allied healthcare professionals, um, to help help reduce falls for these patients. So the clinic services offered are um, three parts really. So the first part is a fall risk assessment. The second part is a comprehensive geriatric assessment. And the third part moves towards evidence-based recommendations. So I'll take a moment to describe each of these parts in a little bit more detail. So looking at the falls risk assessment, um, and if you're interested in visiting the Falls Clinic website, I've just included the web link up at the top of the slide. Um, we do use a tool I mentioned developed by Stephen Lord and colleagues in Australia called the Physiological Profile Assessment. And this tool um, is useful for really assessing an individual's risk of falling and it helps us identify individualized risk factors. So as we age, we notice that our vision, our leg strength, our sensation in the peripheries um, may decrease over time, and it also can lead to a decline in strength and our balance. And there's substantial evidence in the literature that has shown that assessing uh, falls risk for individuals can really reduce uh, future falls by up to 60%. Um, so this tool, the physiological profile assessment, um, was developed and it really measures five key physiological domains that have been proven to predict falls in older adults. So these include balance, hand reaction time, quadricep strength, and proprioception, as well as depth perception. And then below just is an indication of how we would interpret the scoring. But essentially what we see is the greater the score, uh, the greater the falls risk. Here is just a, a few pictures of one of a uh, former research assistant uh, administering the physiological profile assessment. Um, so we can see some pictures here of assessing um, stability, strength, um, reaction time, and proprioception. Now, a key component of care provided at the Falls Prevention Clinic is uh, geriatrician assessment. So uh, we have a team of geriatricians that um, provide a comprehensive overview and assessment of individuals' medical conditions. And so um, this includes review of medications, uh, medical history, um, all with the goal of detecting contributors or risk factors for falling. 
It also does include a functional review, so uh, an examination of individuals' daily lifestyles and other um, activities that individuals generally perform um, in the day, as well as their home environment. As well, I mentioned it does include a fall risk assessment, um, so the geriatrician will review results of the fall risk assessment, um, as well as physical and other cognitive assessments with patients. And from these, the geriatrician then makes some conclusions and recommendations for factors that can be addressed and can be modified. Um, so this can include assessing environment um, and how to improve physical function through exercise, and it can also lead to referrals. So referrals for different tests and investigations. And last but not least, um, the Falls Clinic website also contains, so I uh, posted earlier the BC guidelines and they contain a number of uh, wonderful resources. And um, the Falls Clinic also does contain some resources on falls prevention. Um, so these can detail um, risk factors linked to falls um, as well as steps for individuals to stay on their feet. Now, another um, core component of the Falls Prevention Clinic, like I mentioned, is recommendations or referrals. And one of these is exercise prescription. Um, so one of the exercise programs that has the, the strongest evidence and most compelling, compelling evidence for false prevention, both primary false prevention and secondary false prevention, is the Otago Exercise Program. Um, most recently, Dr. Teresa Lou Ambrose and colleagues conducted a randomized control trial where they showed a 36% reduction in rate of falls among individuals who had um, participated in the Otago exercise program over a period of 12 months. Now, the Otago exercise program, I'll just highlight it's a home-based strength and balance retraining exercise program, often delivered by a nurse or a physical therapist. And um, it's delivered through a series of five home visits um, where the exercises, the, the participant is trained on how to properly and safely do the exercises. And then they are progressed um, where the exercises become more challenging over time as they're ready for them. Now, just to move on to a few more um, aspects and kind of uh, giving a global idea of our model at the Falls Prevention Clinic. Um, so really, like I mentioned, the key goals are to first start by identifying underlying risk factors contributing to patients' falls. And after these have been identified, the goal is then to address these risk factors to prevent future falls. And this is done using a team-based approach um, with healthcare and allied healthcare professionals. So this following is just a diagram illustrating what a first appointment for step one would look like. So when we're identifying underlying risk factors for falls, patients receive a comprehensive cognitive assessment um, as well as comprehensive physical assessments and a geriatric exam. So a baseline appointment um, can take up to three hours for one patient. And after we've identified these uh, risk factors, we then look to address them through the following pathway. Um, so using this geriatrician-led multidisciplinary approach, uh, patients who flow through the falls prevention clinic do receive individually tailored assessment. So their treatment um, and management is based on their own individual risk factors for falling. So common um, outputs from this are that referrals may be made um, to various healthcare and allied healthcare professionals, um, as well as a focus on recommendations for addressing any factors that are modifiable. So this might include medication adjustment, uh, vision, uh, glasses adjustment, shoe, uh, non-slip shoe recommendations, um, as well as environmental modifications. 
And there may also be some order uh, for tests or investigations. And follow-up is based on geriatrician recommendation as well. So what you see here is that it's basically a continuous feedback loop um, and bi-directional. So we see that um, it begins with a referral from a physician. Uh, patients receive their initial appointment. Uh, from that, they're, they're given individualized recommendations, and then they receive a follow-up. And then this information is always fed back to the referring physician. I'd just like to give you an idea of, of who we see at the Falls Prevention Clinic. Um, so we, we definitely see a population at high risk for falls. Um, the average age is around 81 years, um, and we have 64% uh, approximately um, that are female. Uh, interestingly, we see that a number of individuals, everyone has sustained at least one fall in the past 12 months, but we do have a number of individuals who are recurrent fallers. Um, looking at the cognitive status, uh, we also do have a fairly large um, proportion of our population that do have mild cognitive impairment. So as we move forward, um, we really are, are committed to um, learning as much as we can about how to provide the best care for, for individuals that fall. Um, right now, the focus of the falls prevention clinic is on individuals at high risk for sustaining future falls. So the focus is on secondary prevention. Um, to summarize that the clinic is medically focused and uses the multidisciplinary approach. Um, and it does provide on-site access to referrals. And we're, we're working as we move forward to, to be able to provide more resources for um, things like exercise prescription. Um, the, the BC guidelines I showed earlier do have some very um, helpful links to uh, different types of exercise prescription, similar to what I've mentioned here, um, where they do provide videos um, and um, tutorials and, and handouts as well on a lot of these prescriptions that are recommended. And as we move forward, we really are um, keen to work uh, at forming more close relationships with continuing care and home care um, on a case-by-case -case basis. So I've mentioned the BC guidelines a few times for falls prevention resources, and um, in moving to closing in the next few minutes, I'll just highlight a few more. Um, there are several resources, and, and, and so um, common ones are for practitioner resources, um, as well as patient and caregiver resources, so 811, um, as well as a number of physical activity services. And um, in the previous BC guidelines slide that I posted, there also is some great links as well, like I mentioned, for um, exercise prescription. Um, and there have been some uh, great videos that have been developed for the Otago exercise program on that link as well. And then there's also um, 211 for home and community care. So I'd like to close by uh, thanking all the support. Um, so the Falls Prevention Clinic um, over the years has been strongly supported by um, the Canadian Institutes for Health Research um, and the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research now um, named Michael Smith Health Research BC. And also um, really grateful for our multidisciplinary team at the Falls Prevention Clinic. And thank you all for your time today. Hi, Jennifer, can you hear me? Hi, yes. Hi, so I just um, put a Q&A into the chat for you. Um, and it is, uh, the question is, it's my understanding that in many cases, many elders fall due to bone fractures slash breaks and not the result of an accidental fall causing a break. Could you please speak to this? Right, absolutely. So um, the reasons for falling and injuries from falls may be different for every individual. Um, so 
that would be something that would be reviewed by the geriatrician um, if it was due to a bone fracture, uh, due to um, breaks. And so that would be addressed, um, you know, based on that own individual's risk factor for falling. So if they had osteoporosis, that would be um, an issue that would be handled by the geriatrician. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question here about the uh, wait list for assessment at the Falls Clinic. Right. So um, the wait list for assessment at the Vancouver Falls Prevention Clinic um, right now is is a couple of months. Um, the clinic operates weekly, and um, we are able to see about five five patients per day. Um, so the wait list right now is is a couple of months, but it can fluctuate a little bit depending on timing. Fantastic. There's another question here about translation services uh, during assess assessments for those with limited English language skills. That's a great question. Yeah, it's an important one. And it's one that we are working on. So we do have some access to translation services, but it's something that we would like to um, improve upon. Okay, fantastic. Um, other questions uh, in the chat here. Um, my community does not have an OsteoFit program or an Otego exercise program. How can we start one or find a practitioner with this training? Right. Um, that, yeah, that is a, I think it's something that our team is working on. So there are, um, I'm definitely happy to share the link um, for the Otago videos. Um, right now we are working on initiative to try and um, roll out some of this training across, um, across BC. Um, but I definitely am happy to um, share with the individual that asked the question um, a contact if they are interested in, in receiving training for, for this type of um, program delivery. Okay, fantastic. Um, another question around um, exercise brochures that we can order. Do you have any connections as to exercise brochures? Um, I don't know if that's an individual uh, or if someone's uh, typing that in as an organization. Right. So again, I am happy to provide. So there is a direct link that shows the brochures and the Otago videos on the BC guidelines that are um, are published. Um, as well, a good contact. So Don Skelton, um, who is in the UK, um, regularly provides training um, for the Otago exercise program. And so um, Don Skelton does have a number of resources and brochures available for the um, for the Otago exercise program. So that would also be a good contact. Okay, great. Uh, another question here from Lisa. I'm wondering why there's a distinction between study cohorts who live at home versus living in a clinical setting. Right. We, I guess there's a distinction between individuals who um, live in the community compared with individuals who may live in a um, acute care setting. Uh, because these individuals are are in different environments. Um, and so we often see that there's quite different um, risk factors that uh, predispose individuals to falling. And so sometimes it we look at these populations separately because um, recommendations for the populations may may differ. Okay, terrific. Um, oh, this is a question from Victoria. Are there any plans to offer assessments in the city of Victoria, given the large percentage of elderly residents? Um, currently, um, we would love that, but, um, you know, it's uh, like everything constrained by funding. Um, so we don't have current expense to plan to Victoria, uh, but we are looking at ways where we can hopefully, um, roll out strategies. So right now there is a satellite falls prevention clinic in um, Prince George, and we are 
uh, actively examining ways in which we might be able to increase reach for this program. Great. Um, one other question here. Will you be sending out some of the links you mentioned? And uh, I think I can answer that on behalf of family caregivers and say that, yes, we will be sending out um, links as well as the link to the recording of the full um, the full webinar. Um, but uh, uh, Jennifer, I leave that to you and Victoria to sort of connect, connect on that piece um, to be sure that we do send out the links and the information um, that has been shared. Yes, no, happy to share um, what's on the slides and um, certainly happy to share a summary list of the links that were mentioned in the presentation. That's no problem. Great. I'm going to keep asking because keep, uh, questions keep coming in here. They do, um, yeah. And another question here, do you recommend a particular accessory for notifying help when you fall, for example, a wrist or, or neck monitor? Right. I wish I could comment on that. I'm not super familiar with um, a particular brand that is best, um, so I, I'm not able to comment on that. Sorry. No, that makes sense. Um, Victoria, I see that you're on. Did you yeah. want to, to uh, ask a few of these questions as well? Yeah, I'm just looking through the question list here, and uh, I see uh, one from Liz Forbes. We would like to download our own exercise program. Both of us are in our 80s and have experienced falls in within a rural area in the Cowichan Valley, which is just north of Victoria. Uh, so that is a good question. Are, is there some kind of programming they can download? Right. There, there is. So the BC guidelines do have a link um, to uh, different exercise brochures, and there are some um, YouTube videos that were developed that detail how to do the exercise program. Um, our, our recommendation is um, always in consideration of safety, though, as well. Um, and so uh, this is why we do recommend um, the Otago program be delivered by a healthcare professional um, because it may need modifications based on individuals' risk factors for falling. Um, so safety is always a primary concern um, uh, before kind of partaking, it would be a good idea to consult with a healthcare professional. Okay, that's great, thanks. Um, that looks like it was, it was the last of the questions. Um, I have questions of my own. I've got a number of folks who are people that I participate in their caregiving teams who um, have had falls in the past year. Two of them live here in BC and, and one set of folks lives in Alberta. Is there a similar program in Alberta? I'm not aware of a similar type of program in Alberta, but um, we do have some different types of programs across um, BC. So there may be comparators. So um, for example, in the Okanagan and Kelowna, there's a seniors wellness clinic. Um, so maybe, you know, um, looking into what's available in the community, sometimes wellness clinics can also offer um, um, multidisciplinary care. Um, right. But I don't have a specific name um, that I could suggest in Alberta. Sorry. That's that's fine. I can do my own digging. It's all good. Um, I did have another question that came up. What do you do if you don't have a physician to refer you? Um, that's a great question. I, I think it would depend on um, location. Um, I think that's a huge um, we're seeing a lot of individuals without without physicians, um, but the pathway, I guess I can just speak to the pathway at the Falls Prevention Clinic in Vancouver is that referrals come from either an emergency department presentation. Um, so a physician you would see at the emergency department or from a family physician, um, which may be from a, um, a usual family physician or a family physician from a walk-in clinic. Right. Okay. Um, I'm curious as well about things like mobility aids. Do you recommend as part of your services certain aids or, or referral to mobility aids or devices? Generally, our geriatrician will review any type of adaptive aids. And um, 
the we don't have blanket type of recommendations because it really is um, individualized so kind of highlighting the importance of the really identifying an individual's risk factor and coming up with recommendations specific to that individual. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I am really grateful that you took the time to uh, present this to us and to our caregiving audience. Um, thank you again for the information. I will touch base with you around some of the extra resources. And uh, we will be making a recording of this presentation available on our website. So thank you for your willingness to be up there in posterity. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation and thank you everyone for your questions. Always a great opportunity to continue learning. Fantastic. And just to remind folks that you can always reach out to our caregiver support line. If you're looking for information or resources, you can connect to the caregiver support line and uh, staff on the line will be able to uh, resource you to what's available in your community. Uh, we also have our learning center with lots of information that you can watch, read, listen to. Um, we have support groups available and we have our newsletter and uh, e-news blasts that go out regularly. So keep an eye on what we have out there. Our fall newsletter did have a couple of articles highlighting fall prevention. So we, we know it's that time of year when we have to start thinking about uh, what's going on in our outside environment as well as uh, being mindful of what's going on in our homes in terms of safety.